Let's look at it in Acts chapter 15. We're going to start in verse uh, 36. Paul and Barnabas, uh, to bring you up to speed, if you're just joining us, up through the first 15 chapters of Acts, the, the, the church is birthed at the end of uh, Acts 1 and into Acts 2. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes upon the new Jewish believers. They start to proclaim the gospel in foreign languages. All the people that come from different parts of the world hear the gospel, hear the good news of Jesus, and they're like, man, I want to get saved. I need to, to repent of my sin. And so this whole group of people get saved. They become the nucleus of the first church. Inside of the nucleus of the first church, there's some leaders of this church. You obviously have all the 11 apostles. Uh, the 12th apostle, Judas, hung himself before uh, at Jesus' as Jesus was being crucified because he betrayed Christ, so he died. There's 11. They raised up Matthias to complete the 12. After this time, Paul, also known as Saul, is persecuting the church. He's a Pharisee. He's a religious leader that hates this Christian sect of Judaism because he believes that it's heretical and wrong, and so he's trying to kill all the Christians. Jesus appears to him in a light on a road to Damascus going to arrest and kill Christians. He becomes a Christian, the antagonizer of the church actually becomes a Christian. He now, with this new life, becomes a leader in not only the church at Jerusalem, minorly, but majorly he goes all around the world, primarily in the Gentile Greek-Roman world, spreading the gospel. He is one of the great leaders of the church. Paul is going to be from, from Acts 15 to the end of Acts. And now we're going to see Acts and Barnabas, uh, Paul and Barnabas, two of the leaders of this group of, of the first church, now they're going to get in a fight. And scripture records it right here. Doesn't that make you happy already? You're like, maybe I'm not such a loser, right? You're like, wow, hey, I can't believe it. Like godly men actually get in a fight right here. Here you go, here we go. You're like, I think there's hope for me today. Verse 36, and after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we have proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are. So right here, verse 36, they planted churches. Paul and Barnabas have planted churches, gent primarily Gentile churches, or in Gentile areas, have some Jewish believers in them, but they're primarily Gentile churches all over the world. And, uh, and we see this in the, in the map uh, right here. They're going to take off from Antioch, which is, is north of Israel, and they're going to take off across the sea and plant all these churches up in Asia Minor, which is kind of to the northwest of them. So he says, hey, let's go back and revisit all these churches we planted. Verse 37. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark, who wrote the book of Mark in your Bible. But Paul thought best not to take with them the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them in the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, which is a, an island off the coast. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went throughout Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. Number one, Paul and Barnabas are Christian brothers and ministers. It's interesting to me how sometimes the people you fight with most are the people you love the most. Isn't that weird? It's like for many of us that got married, I'm going to go where angels fear to tread this morning. Ready? Ready? Apart from your sex life, apart from your sex life, this is probably the most uh, touchy area of, of, of anybody's relationship, but we're going to head there. Okay, ready? For most couples, we don't know how this happens. Where when you're dating somebody, pre-marriage, it's like, oh man, this is the best days of my life. We go to Applebee's every night. <laughs> we share jokes. She laughs at all of my weird idiosyncrasies. He opens the door for me. Enter my queen into Applebee's. <laughs> and there's this rush of love and connection and soul matching between a man and a woman and you feel this like overflowing well of just like yeah Jesus <laughs> but then this weird thing happens where they stand before a pastor and get married 
And there's this beautiful wedding and connection between a man and a woman spiritually. Then they go on their honeymoon and physically they connect in the most intimate way possible. And then after that, maybe some kids that kind of look like one or both of them come along and you start this little beautiful family. But it's weird that it goes from you're the most amazing thing in my life to this is a nightmare come true. How did I end up with you? (laughs) How does this happen? How do we get from A to disaster in a few short months, years, minutes? How does that happen? The reality is, is the longer you're with somebody, because you're both sinners, you're going to run into conflict. Those that are the deepest in relationship with you are those that you will fight the deepest with. Those that you have invested the most in are those that will offend you the most. In other words, most of the time, strangers to you are not the ones that you'll continually fight with. It's gonna be the one that knows you the most. It's gonna be the one that's with you the most. So watch, watch what happens here between Paul and Barnabas, two godly men. They end up fighting with one another so severe, they actually have to split. Many of us, that's happened in our relationships, right? We've, 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 we've had a relationship with our husband or wife and we just go, you know what, I'm out of here. We need to separate, probably get divorced. There's no hope for us, we're out. I'm tired of fighting with you. We've gone from awesome days of love to this disaster of, of divorce uh, proceedings and I'm, I'm done. Watch, it's not because you've had issues. Everybody has issues, right? Everybody has issues. But it's because many times we haven't dealt with them properly. We haven't dealt with our own dysfunction properly, and we haven't dealt with the dysfunction of two dysfunctional people dealing dysfunctionally in a dysfunctional way. We haven't learned how to healthy move towards reconciliation. And we're going to see what happens to Paul and Barnabas right here. But they are brothers. They are Christian brothers. Barnabas actually went and found Paul after he got saved and said, this guy has the spirit of God on him. Let's do ministry together. So Barnabas actually went and got Paul and go, let's do ministry together. And Paul's like, right on, let's do it. And they planted all these churches together. They have a history. They spend their lives together doing ministry. And all of a sudden it comes to an end. Paul and Barnabas are Christian brothers and ministers. Barnabas was among the first Jews to become Christians, and he became a a man full of faith, encouragement, and generosity. Barnabas is the kind of guy that if you could get a church full of Barnabases, you could change the world. If you could get a church full of guys that go, you know what, church is not about me, it's about other people. We We are building that kind of church here. The fact that we almost had 120 people volunteer to give up their, some of you guys took vacation for the whole week to come do our VBS of their own work vacation. That's the the depth of love that people have, not just for the people, but for Jesus. Because when you love Jesus above people, Jesus orients how you spend time with people. If you have no value for Jesus, you go, what what can people do for me? And when people let you down, you go, I'm out of here. I don't need this. Who needs this drama? But when Jesus is your highest value, it supersedes the dysfunction of people. Because the functional God makes you, even though you're dysfunctional, he makes you functional and love other people. If you don't have this right relationship, then all this dysfunction here will cause you to step back and go, I'm not going to do this. I don't need this. But with the functional relationship with God, you can get over any dysfunction of people. Right? Many of us have experienced that. When Jesus intersected our lives, we go, I see life in a whole new way. I'm going to take my own vacation time to go minister to children. Where, where years before, be like, I'm a businessman. I'm not going to take time off to go. I'm going to go to Hawaii. These kids can just hang out in Temecula by themselves for all I care and eat some goldfish. <laughs> but you realize when Jesus intersects your life, wow, your life and mind changes. Your heart changes toward people. Your heart changes toward the things of God. Right? For those of us that's happened to you, some of us it hasn't happened yet, but for some of us it has, like me, I would never be a pastor. Ever, ever, ever. But you know what? God put this inside of us. And it's been fantastic to watch God do amazing things. 
But that doesn't happen until your heart changes. After Paul became a Christian, Barnabas sought him out to partner with him to spread the gospel. Jesus enabled both men to do miracles, and as prophets and pastors, they became a formidable team, using their gifts and passion to reach the world. Deep friendships are formed through deep joys and trials. And I, I want to speak to this really quickly. Listen, if you don't feel like you have a depth of relationship with people, if you feel like everything is surface, that's not the other person's fault. It's not the other person's fault. If other people are so surfacy that you can't get below the surface, that's not their fault. That means that you need to work on finding the people that God has, has sent to you, the people that resonate with your own heart. You'll find those people. Some of us are really weird. Some of us are strange, strange people. And we're like, Jesus, I don't know if anyone has been built like me in the history of humanity. Guess what? There are some people like you. There's other weirdos going, where are all the weirdos at? And all of a sudden, you know, when two weirdos find each other, they're like, oh, Jesus is real. I can't believe it. There's people like me in the world. Here's the thing. When you find people that resonate with you, you will experience a depth of relationship. But it will never happen when you draw back and go, I'm just going to wait around until something's good for me. You need to be actually out there going, hey, how can I minister? You'll be amazed that when you say, how can I minister for God, how God brings people into your life, they all of a sudden you have a depth of relationship where you go, my life has value now. Because for many of us, our life has been revolving around how much money I make or the nice car I drive or the house I have, and those aren't wrong things. It's okay. It's okay to have nice things. But the point is, is that there's no depth in money. There's no depth in stuff, right? Those things are great, awesome, enjoy them, but there's no depth there. Depth is in relationship. But relationships are hard, right? It's not, you know, the Mercedes might break down, it might irritate you, but it never talks back. Well, I don't know, I'm actually the lady in the nav might talk back or whatever, but she never says anything that really irritates you unless you took a wrong turn, right? I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with those things, but there's no depth there. When you go deep, though, we open ourselves up to being hurt. And that's why many of us go, okay, I'm not gonna get hurt again. So I'm not gonna go seek out those people that, that, that will let me have a depth of relationship. But the problem is, we realize that all our relationships are super surface. Or they're just super surfacy. Hey, how's it going? How's work? Oh, good. Okay, cool. Thanks for the conversation. <laughs> but, but when you go deep, some of you guys know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> when you go deeper, when it's like, dude, my marriage is falling apart. How can I, how can I get some help? I don't know how to raise my kids. I wasn't even raised right. I don't even know how to raise my own kids. I don't even have a dad. It's like when you start moving into a depth of relationship, you're going to have some conflict. But if you handle it correctly, you will see a beauty that you could never have had if you didn't step out and be vulnerable. Vulnerable is scary, but vulnerability opens the door to beauty. Vulnerability opens the door to beauty, which is the reason when men and women get married, they open that door to vulnerability. Men and women are drawn together by God, like magnets. We don't even know why we get married. But God draws men and women together. And you want to know why? Because the crucible of learning who you are takes place in depth of intimacy. And, the, and one of the deepest places to grow is inside your own marriage. God uses marriage to mold you. You see where you're a screw-up, you see where your spouse is a screw-up, and you realize... Jesus, help us in our corruptness. And hopefully, through that crucible, you become pure. Your relationship goes deep, and you just, you love that person. Because there's a depth of intimacy there that would, ne would have never been there had you not been open to be vulnerable. And we see that with Paul and Barnabas. They're brothers in Christ. They're doing ministry together. They're both prophets. They can raise people from the dead. That's a pretty hardcore brother, Right? Hey, Paul, nice job raising that guy from the dead. <laughs> Me and you forever. I mean, that's brotherhood right there. I mean, many of us that have gone to battle together, uh, you know, at war, across the seas, wherever, you build a depth. I mean, you want to talk about intimacy, quick intimacy. When you, when you know you might die, one of you might die, I mean, that builds like, whew, we're there for each other. And same thing with the ministry. 
is you and I need to have a focus on God that no matter what happens, no matter where we go, we're in it together because that builds depth of relationship. When you have a focus, that builds depth. And Paul and Barnabas have that focus. They're planting churches. They're real brothers together. Number two, Paul and Barnabas have a severe disagreement, okay? So this is like when you, right after you get married, you get in the limo, and you're like, this is going to be paradise forever. And all of a sudden, you're like, I don't want to go there. <laughs> what? This is what we talked about before we get, had our marriage ceremony. After, we were going to get in the, in the limo, and we were going to go to Dairy Queen. I've been, I've been waiting for this all ceremony. I don't want to go to Dairy Queen. What are you talking about? Dilly bars are there. There's all kinds of glorious things. We talked about pulling up the limo to the Dairy Queen, and we were going to get Dairy Queen. Well, you know what? I'm lactose intolerant. <laughs> what do you mean? Okay, well, then I'll go. No, that'll waste time in the limo. We only have it for two more hours. And all of a sudden, five minutes after you got married, you're in your first fight right in the limo while she's still in her dress and you're still in your tuxedo. It's like there's going to be a point in your life and my life where the people you're most connected with, you have the most conflict with. And that's what happens right here. Let's see how they deal with it. Having started numerous churches together during a previous missionary journey, Paul suggested revisiting each church. Barnabas agreed and insisted on bringing his nephew, John Mark. Mark had originally gone along to help them on their first journey, but had abandoned them to go back home to Jerusalem halfway through. Because Paul didn't view Mark as being able to handle the task, he refused to take him, causing division between the two men. They had a, such a severe disagreement, and the Greek word there is paroxymus. In this context, it means to incite to anger. And we get the English word paroxysm, which means a sudden, often violent attack or fit, as in an epileptic seizure. Because of this, they agreed to disagree and began separate journeys. Even godly gifted people can disagree on how to best carry out and accomplish God's will. You realize that the Greek word there, when it says they got into a severe disagreement, literally means like a shaking fist. Like a, like a, like a, like a, we, we would use a word in English, like an epileptic seizure. Like it's a word that doesn't mean like, they sat down and you know, I think we have a minor misunderstanding between you and I. It says, they, I almost see this picture the way it's painted that they almost came to blows. Barnabas, his nephew is John Mark, Mark of the, of the gospel Mark. He wants to take him along again. Mark had, had bailed on them. Can you put that map back up real quick? I want, I want you to see this. They left from Antioch, which is, which is way over there to the right where the star is. They, they, they sailed down to Cyprus together. This is... Um, uh, Barnabas and Paul, they sail down to Cyprus. They go all the way up to Perga. See Perga in lower Cilicia right there? They get to Perga. This is their first trip together. John Mark, who's a young man, probably in his late teens, early 20s, he, because of what's happened in the first, uh, in chapters 13 and 14 of, of Acts, it, Paul almost dies. They get into all this conflict in the places they're trying to spread the gospel. John Mark goes, I'm out. He leaves Perga, catches a boat to come back to Jerusalem, which is way down there in the south. So he, he, John Mark goes AWOL during a missionary journey. Paul, who's hardcore, I mean, Paul's about as hardcore as it gets. Barnabas is like the encourager, but he's still hardcore too. So you got these grown men spreading the gospel. John Mark is like, this is scary. He goes back to Jerusalem to be with mom. And I can guarantee you in the back of Paul's head, he's like, oh man, John Mark, if you were my own son, I'd paddle your butt right off its body. You little weenie. <laughs> Couldn't even hang. And Barnabas is like, I'm sure in the back of his mind, he's like, he's a young man. He hasn't learned to, to, what it means to like, you know, do these things as a grown man yet. So in the back of their mind, they're still doing their journey. They go up, plant all these churches. So later, Acts 15, they go, let's go revisit these churches. Barnabas now goes, hey, let's take John Mark again. And Paul in the back of his mind, oh no, oh no. We're not taking that little loser. <laughs> He's not going with us. This is a grown man job. We go where grown men go. 
We don't take little cheesy, puffy little kids that are like, I need to go home to mommy in Jerusalem. I know he's related to you, Barnabas, but I'm not taking him. I guarantee you that. I'm not stepping one foot outside this door if John Mark is going. And Barnabas goes, what's wrong with you, man? Don't you have any grace? Don't you have any mercy for a, for a kid that it was his first time really out of home? And we're like getting stones thrown at us and getting chucked out of cities. Don't you think that's a little scary, Paul? Who knows how you would be if you were 19, Paul, and you had to come along. What's your problem? And Paul goes, I'll tell you what my problem is. Man, when I was 19, I was a Pharisee. I was learning at the feet of Gamaliel. Your little John Mark, he's been like baking bread with mom for the last 18 years. He's never done real man work his whole life. What are you talking about? Well, you know what, Paul? Maybe it's about time that he did some real man work. Don't you think that God put him in our lives to maybe, I don't know, disciple him, Paul? You know what, Barnabas? I'm so tired of your Aramaic lip. <laughs> in any language you speak, Barnabas, I'm tired of listening to it. And Barnabas is like, you are the most cold-blooded little short guy I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and it says they almost come to blows. Very possibly, Barnabas, wanting to bring along his relative in the faith starts to go berserk about kind of protecting his own, his own family. Nothing gets us crazier than when somebody offends our family, right? Right? I said that during the VBS night. This room's packed with parents literally out the door. They're, they're watching their kids perform on stage just like we did for our, for our thing. And you can just see the pride swelling up and all the cameras are out. I'm standing in the back and I just see this sea of cameras it was like video, video time. And mom, you know, ladies are getting kicked in the back so they can get a better shot of their kid. Parents are just, grandparents too, wild about their kids. Right? They're just, they're just, cra it just it's, it's something weird. Just like when you get married, something weird happens in your relationship. When you have a kid, something weird just happens as a parent. You just, all of a sudden, your mind just goes, I don't even want kids. But all of a sudden, you have kids and you go, oh, oh. Oh, this baby's a total stranger to you. It's never been in your life one minute, but all of a sudden, the minute you get it, you're like, oh, if anybody touches little sweetie here, somebody's going to die. <laughs> I mean, this weird thing happens. All of a sudden, you become super defensive, and you've never spent more than an hour with this infant. Just popped into your life, literally. <laughs> you haven't had an hour to even talk. But all of a sudden, God just puts this like instinct on you to protect your own. And that's exactly what I believe Barnabas was about his own, his own flesh and blood. He's like, man, this is, this is my family. This is la familia. I don't know if he said. <laughs> this is my family, man. I think you could have a little grace with my family, don't you think, Paul? Paul's like, hey, man, you know what I care about? I care about the gospel. I don't care about your little weenie kid. I care about the gospel. So, both of them have good points. In fact, John Mark has failed them already, so Paul pretty much has the upper hand because he's like, I'm not taking him again because I don't want to have to make sure he gets back on a boat back to mom. But Barnabas has a good point too. It's like, hey, let's show a little grace. They both have good points, but they have such a severe disagreement, they split. And many, many times, like, like some of our marriages, we go, you know what, we can't, we've come to an impasse. So maybe we should just separate. And, I, and, and let me bring this to, to you and me. Or if you're single and you're thinking about getting married, let me, let, me, let me say this to you. There may come a point when you have to separate because the water's so muddy that you can't see clearly about your relationship or even yourself. But let me, let me, let me say this to you. God wants your marriage to not just survive. God wants your marriage to thrive. And sometimes you need to separate to go, wow, I'm dysfunctional, she's dysfunctional, we need to get straight, we need to get some counseling, blah, blah, blah. I never counsel people to get divorced. Sometimes it has to happen through different biblical means. There's allowance for that. But primarily, the overarching thing about, with God is that if you're married now, he wants you to die married to that person. That's the, that's the ideal of God. 
when you separate, there should be a time when you come back together. You get counseling, you figure each other out, you figure out what needs to happen in your marriage, you come together. You know the series I did on, uh, on Family Matters where I went through uh, different issues of the family? That's been, that's been blowing out the door ever since I did that series. People buying that, 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 that uh, CD of like all the sermons I did, 25 hours of sermons on the family. Because people know I gotta get my family right. If I don't get my family right, everything else feels dysfunctional. So even if you have to separate for a while, there should be a time when you can come back together. That's the ideal, right? That's what you should work towards, correct? Everybody with me? I got one person clapping their hands, okay. <laughs> That's the ideal, right? All of us in marriages, we got dysfunction. We got fighting going on. But here's my, here's my hope for you, is that unlike secular uh, counseling, which just kind of says, are you happy? No, not really. Are you happy? No, not really. Okay, then why don't you guys go, go, go be with somebody that, you can, that can make you happy? That's secular counseling. Try to hang on, but if you can't, then just go find somebody to make you happy. Because life is too short. Well, let me tell you something. Life is too short, but you're going to stand before God. And you're going to have a different view of what he wanted for your relationship when you're dead than when you do now. So right now is when you make all the choices for God. You go, I need help, she needs help, but together we can get help. And even if we have a severe disagreement, so much so that we need to separate for a short amount of time, we should always focus on coming back together. That's the focus, right? So for many of us that are divorced or single or we're on our second or third marriage or whatever, I want you to realize whatever you know, relationship you're heading towards right now, God wants that thing to thrive. The next one, he wants to thrive. This one that you're in right now, he wants to thrive. He wants to make it great. You're going to have disagreements. You're going to have impasses. But eventually, it should always come back to joining back together. Paul and Barnabas have such a severe disagreement, they're like, we're out. And they go do ministry separately. And let's see how God handles that. Number three, Paul and Barnabas part ways. Paul and Barnabas part ways. Barnabas leaves with, with Mark. So Barnabas actually does end up taking Mark. He goes, you know what, forget you, Paul. You're some psycho crazy guy. I'm taking Mark. He gets on with Mark. He goes to Cyprus to that, to that uh, island and starts doing ministry there. Paul goes, I'm not taking a, a, a guy that can't handle it. He, he takes um, Silas with him. He, he partners up with a guy named Silas, and they go around and revisit all the churches that they were going to head to previously. Barnabas leaves uh, with Mark for Cyprus, and Paul picks, uh, with Mark for Cyprus, and Paul picks Silas to go visiting the churches. Although it is not wrong to become angry when disrespect, dishonor, or immoral things need to be confronted, it must be done without sinning. You know what the Bible says? It says, be angry and do not sin. Which means, and let, let me, let me, I'm going to lift some of the guilt from some of you guys. It's not wrong to be angry about the right things. It's not wrong to be angry about the right things. When you get angry about the right things, don't commit sin with that anger. God gets angry, right? Jesus got angry, right? At the right things. You get mad, at, you get angry at disobedience. You get angry at immorality. You call it on the carpet. There should be legitimate anger there. However, plates should probably not fly towards the person. You might be angry about the right thing. However, do not commit sin in your anger. It's a difference between Jesus and us. Jesus got angry, but Jesus never sinned. Many times we can get angry, but let's not sin. It's okay to be angry. But be angry about the right things. Though this incident is probably descriptive, which means plain, plainly saying what just happened, rather than prescriptive, or saying what's the right thing to do, sometimes Christians of equal passions and purpose must separate. In God's sovereignty, he used this one disagreement to start two mission teams and train two other men instead of one. So you know what the beauty of this particular scenario is? They split Barnabas takes his relative, John. Paul takes Silas, who wasn't going to go at all, and they split waves, and they, now they do twice as much ministry. So God even uses their disagreement to bless other people. Isn't that amazing? Watch how amazing this is. Ready? If, you're already, if you're, one of your eyes is falling asleep, poke it real quick and come back. Ready? Watch how amazing this is. This is, this is oh gosh, this is the most fantastic ability of God. 
even when, even when people sin against you, God can still use that sin that people have done against you, the damage people have brought into your own life, God can still use that for his glory. It's amazing. It's ama- There's no other God like our God, because no other God exists. The real, true, living God is able to take even the garbage other people have dragged into your world and recycle it into something beautiful in your life. It's amazing. It's amazing. For those, for those of us that have been abused or things have gone on in our life where we're just like, I don't know if I can get over this, I got some issues in my life. It's amazing how God can bring healing to that and then use even that sin to help other people. It's amazing. Only God can do those things. God uses this disagreement, this impasse, to go start two missionary teams rather than just one. He would have done something awesome with Paul and Barnabas, like he has been, but he, now he does something awesome with two. And they go off and do two missionary journeys, and God blesses both of them. That, you know what? That's happened in my life. There have been godly men that I've... <laughs> There have been times where I've sat across a table at an Italian restaurant with men that I've done ministry with and I've been so angry at them that I have literally got up out of my seat, up in there. I'm a really mellow guy. I'm, I'm, if you don't know me, I'm, just, I'm typically, you're just like, whatever. Whatever. I'm so mellow, so laid back, but when I get pushed to a point, I got up out of my seat and I got right in this guy's face and I'm pointing in his face in a public restaurant and we're, we are fighting about ministry. <laughs> true story, true story. I am like this, I'm over the table. And there's other guys in the same ministry with me sitting around this table going. <laughs> People around us eating their lasagna going. I was so angry at this brother's need for control and stifling, choking, he was choking the ministry out. And it didn't irritate me that I wasn't getting my way because I hadn't got my way for a long time. But what irritated me is that the ministry was dying on the vine. And it was because of this, 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 this chokehold that was on it. So I got angry about the right thing. I don't know if I did it in the correct format <laughs> well, over lasagna. But my point here being is that there's going to come a point when you, when you get angry about the right things and you do it the right way, God will bless you. God will bless you. Be angry, but do not sin. Get angry about the right things, but don't sin. And guess what? To this day, God has blessed me. You want to know why? Not because I'm awesome but because my heart's desire is to do things the way Jesus wants it done. And I don't care who gets in the way. We're going to go do what Jesus wants done. Even if I get in the way, I get myself out of the way. Oh, put your hands together for Jesus. Hey, that's the truth. Watch. Watch. And, and I'll close with the last point. If you don't get yourself out of the way, God will never do awesome things with you. Because what happens is you just clog the way. Right? It's like a big rock in those uh, hourglasses, and it goes whoop, right in the middle. And all the sand that could be doing its job and, and blessing other people just gets stuck because you have a rock of pride or whatever, or your need to control. It just, it just chokes off your relationships. And I don't know which one it was, whether it was Paul or Barnabas that choked off this relationship, but I can say this. Once they both got out of the way, reconciliation happened. Watch this. Lastly, Paul and Barnabas reconnect. Paul and Barnabas reconnect. Here's, the, here's the, the beautiful ending to this story. Barnabas, probably blinded, uh, possibly blinded by family ties to Mark, who might not have been ready for this trip, and Paul, perhaps unwilling to let a young Christian make a mistake and learn, they eventually reconcile and work together again with Mark. I wish I had time to go in this. 1 Corinthians 9, 6 and 2 Timothy 4, 11. Paul continually talks about bring Mark with you or Mark's with me or uh, Mark is doing these amazing things in my ministry. 
So, I want to say this to you. Don't think in your mind, because this, this goes through our minds, life will be better when I get divorced. If I can just get rid of this marriage, I can go do what God wants me to do. Listen, God puts people in your life so that you can change. God puts difficult people in your life so you can change. God puts difficult spouses in your life so you can change. God puts screaming infants at three in the morning with colic that you have to drive around in a car going, Jesus God Almighty, please, why? Why, why, why? Why, why? I should have practiced birth control like I was talking about with my husband. Now I have to drive around with this screaming infant and I don't sleep for weeks. You know what? God puts colicky infants in your life to make you go, Jesus help, Jesus help, Jesus help. Because if you don't have difficulty, you will never realize how much you need to work. Amen. Right? Because if you don't have difficulty, you go, I am pretty awesome. Wow. If everybody lived like me, the earth would be great. But God puts these these disjointed relationships that have to be worked on. It's like a Gordian knot that has to be worked out to peace. But guess what? With the Spirit of God, you can do it. With the Spirit of God, you can work to peace. With the most difficult relationships in your life, you can come back and reconnect with that father that you haven't seen in 20 years, with that relationship that's like totally out there. God can bring that back to peace if you're willing to be obedient to follow him. And they do. Paul, Paul could have gone, I don't ever want to see John Mark again. And Barnabas could have gone, you know what? You didn't want to see John Mark? Well, I don't want him to see you ever again either. And you know what? You offended my family, so we're not ever going to do ministry again together. How do you like that? There could have been some disconnect forever, but they actually came back together. And they finished their lives doing ministry together. Christians should work for peace and forgiveness whenever possible and not allow anger and bitterness to take root. And I want to end with this, because I want your marriages to flourish. I want your relationships to flourish. Even if you have some of these dysfunctional, disjointed relationships that have broken in the past, I want you to work towards reconciliation. Sometimes divorced people who are still single, they realize they fall back in love again. I, you know, there's guys that get remarried to their spouses who have been like, I'm out, I'll never get back. We got one testifying right now in the front row. That, that happens. You guys are like, that, that never happens. Oh yeah, it does. Because you realize the dysfunction isn't the other person. The dysfunction starts with you and me. When this fixes, then we're able to see with grace the other person, right? Because we go, I'm pretty jacked up so I can make, make room for the other jacked up person in my life. Right? And so, Two people working together can do beautiful things for Jesus. There it just went off. There goes the bell. <laughs> and you're off. That was Jesus saying it's time to do it. The starting bell has gone off. Ready? We'll close right here. Christians should work for peace and forgiveness whenever possible and not allow anger and bitterness to take root. Life is short. Eternity is forever. Here's the thing. Me and my lovely wife, the wife who I love, um, we have been married for almost 20, we're going on 22 years this year, and here's the thing. In 22 years, you run into some doozy problems, okay? You run into some doozy scream, yell matches, okay? It's just the reality of being together. But here's the thing. I want, as we grow together in a marriage, not because we're perfect, like, you're a pastor, you don't even have a problem, be a pastor sometime and check it out. You'll figure it out for yourself. What I want is, as we get older, is for a relationship not to struggle with the same thing it did 15 years ago. I want it to, I want it to flourish into new seasons of ever deepening intimacy between us and a growing love for Jesus and one another. There's no reason that the love of your life has to die because that was like, oh, that was when we were young. Man, it should just be opening and ever expanding into new horizons of, of, of amazing uh, relational and, and ministry together, right? Why does it ever have to stop? It doesn't. But it takes work, right? Every, everything that's valuable takes work. And I want you to think about that this week. God has done all the work to bring us to himself for the most beautiful relationship ever with him through Christ. Now we, you and I, must work to do relationships this way on a horizontal relationship because our vertical relationship is correct through Christ if we believe. Now these relationships have to get straight. Right? No matter the dysfunction, you should be the one pressing towards peace. Some people you can't be at peace with. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm to relieve you of some anxiety. Some people are, you cannot be at peace with. Some people are unreasonable. 
Oh, now I'm preaching right now at the end, right? <laughs> Nobody says anything until the end. Oh, that's right, Pastor. You keep on going about that unreasonable person. <laughs> but that's true. Some people are unreasonable. Some people are locked up by Satan, un unwilling to, to, to be reasonable and peaceable, right? So I'm not saying you can just fix everything. What I am saying is, as far as it's up to you, be at peace. That's all I'm saying, okay? Everybody understand? I don't want to place any guilt upon you if these relationships can't get fixed. What I am saying is, Barnabas was able to be at peace, Paul was able to be at peace, and at the end of their lives, as their ministry lives were together, they were at peace with one another, even with John, with John Mark, right? If Barnabas was not willing to be at peace, or Paul was not willing to be at peace, this relationship never would have reconciled. But because they both were, they came together. That's the ideal, correct? So our ideal together is to be at peace as much as it's up to us. Right? Let us, let us be the people of peace. And when that peace returns to us because it's unaccepted, then we're at peace because we've done what we could. Right? When that peace is now accepted and we can repair that relationship, how beautiful it is when that relationship becomes deeper and more, more meaningful. Isn't that awesome?